Good afternoon. Um, my name is Cleon O'Farrelly. Uh, I'm Professor of Comparative Immunology in Trinity. And uh, this is just such an exciting event. Us scientists go to conferences all over the world, these huge, big conferences. And for years, we had no place to host one of our own here. So this is so exciting to have such a big um, multi-subject uh, topic in this magnificent venue. And we're particularly privileged by the range of people that uh, have, are coming to uh, speak to us. And so it's my privilege to uh, introduce the uh, keynote addressee today, which, who is Peter Doherty, who got the Nobel Prize for Immunology. And uh, the other thing that's often not emphasised about Peter is that he is the only vet who has got a Nobel Prize. And so it is particularly relevant um, today when in Ireland we're thinking that one of the things that's going to rescue us economically is our agricultural industry. There is an, the, um, it'll be the end of the milk levy in two years' time. There's an aim to produce 50% more milk. Do you realise we're talking about 7.5 billion litres of milk? It's huge amounts. What's going to be key to being able to deliver on those aims? The health of the animals. So it is really critical that we understand more about the immune system. And Peter has paved the way to showing how a very basic, fundamental discovery has impacted on our understanding of all of the immune response. It was known that uh, antibodies and phagocytosis could protect against um, bacterial infection, but it wasn't until the discovery of viruses and their tiny size and their ability to hide within cells that a major question appeared over our, the understanding of immunology. How could the immune system detect infection when it was hidden within a cell? And Peter, in collaboration with Ralph Zinkernagel in a small lab in Australia, carried out the most elegant of experiments on mice, mind you, not humans, not cattle, on mice, and discovered, uh, made a fundamental discovery about how the immune system is able to detect viral infection within cells. And of course, based on that fundamental discovery, has burst open a huge amount of uh, insight into how the immune system uh, responds to viral infection. We're still a long way from being able to control viral infection. And as you've gathered, we don't have, uh, you see, we don't have appropriate vaccines against hepatitis C, against HIV, against foot and mouth disease, against um, SARS. The, all these uh, infections have the potential to really destroy human health and our animal health. So his discovery emphasizes the importance on carrying out basic research to blow open um, knowledge in a particular area. And his talk will, today will hopefully inspire us to continue on in that direction in the hopes that the discoveries of today and tomorrow will open equal doors uh, in the future. Peter has been uh, an astonishing a supporter of Irish immunology. He came and reviewed uh, activity, biological activity in Trinity College about 10 years ago with uh, Stephen O'Reilly and uh, made the suggestion that uh, a World Institute of uh, Biological Research might be established um, in the country. It coincided with a, tie, with a conviction that funding basic research in Ireland was the, way, was the way to pave the future to discoveries that were going to impact both on the quality of our life and would have an economic quality. So because of Peter's recommendation, that is why we have this fantastic new facility in Trinity College, the Bi Biomedical Sciences Institute. It is because of his support of, uh, of immunology in general in Ireland, he has spoken at the Irish Society of Immunology, he has visited NUI Maynooth, he has been um, awarded the Ulysses Medal by UCD, he has his own contribution has helped uh, grow and fertilize um, immunological understanding, energy and commitment in this country. So it is a wonderful honor to have him here to talk to us today.
Thanks very much, Claire. I'm going to talk today about immunity uh, pandemics, immunity to influenza, and speak fairly generally. I'm not really going to say a whole lot about the, the uh, really key research focus that we're following, which is uh, the analysis of T-cell mediated immunity and the cytotoxic T-cell. I talked about that earlier this week at Trinity, and, um, uh, and this is a uh, talk somewhat different. Um, I'm involved in research, but at the level that I'm sort of on the way out, really, and uh, I work with uh, groups of bright young people, and you can see two of them there. One group is at St. Jude Children's Research Hospital in Memphis, Tennessee. That's the pink building that you can see. And the other group is at the University of Melbourne in Australia. Um, the uh, building in the middle is a new research building we're building in Melbourne. Uh, you can see just where it stands at the moment. And, um, but what I'm going to really talk about is, is, is the situation we're in with pandemics, uh, where we are, and, and what, our, uh, what our understanding is, and of course, particularly with respect to influenza, which is really our most, of the known viruses that concern us, it is the most potentially dangerous pandemic virus. Now, we're constantly being challenged by all sorts of infections. There are infections coming out of nature constantly, and particularly as the human population size grows bigger, and we make more and more incursions into previously forested areas in uh, the developing world and, and the like, we, we see infections cross over. Uh, some of this is due to human behaviour, uh, and also, of course, as uh, climate change progresses, as we see warming, uh, we will see a movement of uh, insect-borne diseases. We've seen, probably not related to um, global warming, we've seen the insect-borne virus, chikungunya, for instance, suddenly move out of the Indian Ocean area, where it was pretty much restricted, and up as far as, uh, as Italy, and across into Malaysia, and uh, it now becomes an infection of some concern. What it is that sort of kicks off uh, infections suddenly to move, we're, we're not terribly clear. Uh, things will stay in a very limited range often for quite a while and then suddenly it'll become much more of an issue. You may have seen the movie Contagion and if you haven't it's as good a horror movie as you can see. It's a, it's a movie about a pandemic. Usually Hollywood movies about terrible infections are absolutely dreadful because they have to have bad guys and you know you can't just have a bad virus, you have to have a lot of bad guys who do dumb things. It's like uh, soap operas, you know, everyone has to do dumb things all the time or you can't sustain the soap opera. But, um, but this movie is, is kind of realistic and uh, it basically describes a pandemic situation which is really infinitely worse than anything we've seen in modern times. The only thing that would be approach it is what happened when the plague first came across to Europe and we were seeing 30% mortality in European cities in the, uh, in the 14th century and, and thereafter. Totally devastating, certainly influenced the population growth in Europe and uh, went on for hundreds of years. Of course, we had, people had no idea what was going on. They had no understanding of infection. We didn't know about infection until the 19th century with the work of Pasteur and Koch and others. In fact, most human knowledge that's relevant to medicine and is important has certainly been discovered in the last four or 500 years, and much of it has been discovered in the lifetime of people who are alive today, certainly within the last three lifetimes. Uh, the, the virus that Ian Lipkin, the uh, advisor on this movie, uh, invented is a bat paramyxa virus. Uh, it, uh, it comes from a pig, a chef catches it, he gives it to Gwyneth Paltrow, uh, who dies horribly later, and we see the top of her head taken off, which is a bit distressing because she's rather cute. But, uh, <laughs> but it was a plastic dummy, I presume, because she still seems to be around. Um, and. Um, it, it's in, also intriguing that we keep getting revelations from the world of infectious disease. If you'd asked anyone in virology 15 years ago what viruses come out of bat populations, uh, people would have told you uh, rabies virus. If you go to South America, the uh, biting bats, the blood-sucking bats, transmit rabies, and they transmit it particularly to cattle. But that would have been about the extent of what we would say. Over the last decade or so, we've realised that fruit bats carry a whole lot of uh, very 
bad viruses, in fact. Now, you would think fruit bats. Why fruit bats? Well, fruit bats occasionally bite, and particularly the fruit bats in tropical regions have very strong draw jaws because a lot of the tropical fruit has a very very uh, hard outer case. And so uh, if, you do, if someone gets bitten with one of these, it's a real issue. We now know that the Marburg Ebola virus that first emerged in the 1960s, 1970s, these are related viruses, uh, is a virus of bats. And it took till 2005 to actually, or are viruses of bats, it took till 2005 to actually work that out. Um, Ebola, particularly, is really problematic. Uh, if we get occasional outbreaks in humans, we now handle them pretty well because we know how to deal with it. And it's not that infectious. If you don't get coughed and spluttered on or you don't get exposed to blood and so forth, and hospital workers and doctors and the people who care for these situations now understand how to handle that, if, if that doesn't happen, it's not an incredibly infectious virus, but it's a totally horrible virus causes a hemorrhagic fever, and it's also killing a lot of the chimps and gorillas and so forth in Africa. So it's having a big ecological impact. Uh, SARS, the coronavirus that jumped across in 2002, 2003, it, uh, firstly, we found, uh, it took about three months to work that virus out. Within, within the, the, the time of diagnosis of first cases, by the time the international community and a lot of different virologists came together in different parts of the world, it was a totally new virus, a coronavirus, one we hadn't seen before. We now know that bats have a whole spectrum of coronaviruses. Coronaviruses are um, uh, normally in us uh, cause relatively mild respiratory infections. In fact, I may have one at the moment because I got, uh, got out in the rain last night and got hailed on. I didn't uh, think that was going to happen, but uh, um, Dublin has almost as variable a climate as Melbourne, I think, where I live most of the time. But um, that virus came across suddenly. It caused enormous economic loss because people were terrified. Nobody knew what the infection was. They thought initially it was influenza, wasn't influenza, was killing people. It was killing particularly hospital workers. When they worked out what the virus was and they were able to trace the pathogenesis of it and see when the virus was being excreted, they realised that unlike influenza, which is excreted at very high teeters soon after you get infected, the SARS virus is excreted at high teeters late. So with someone with influenza coming into hospital, they may need a lot of care. They may need to be put on a heart-lung machine, on ECMO, but they won't necessarily be excreting much virus. But someone with SARS coming into hospital care, they were pushing out a lot of virus and the hospital doctors and so forth were getting infected. And the other thing about SARS was that it, it survives very well on surfaces. Once we understood SARS, it was stopped very quickly and, uh, and brought under control very quickly. Once we had a test for it, an ELISA-type test, a PCR-type test and so forth, we handled it fast. About 800 people died. You may think that's a lot, but even in a good influenza year, at least 20,000 Americans died from flu, so it's not that many, really. Uh, caused enormous economic loss, particularly in the Asian region and in Toronto. It took two years for some of those economies to actually recover from the effect on, trans on airplane travel, uh, hotels and all the rest of it. Now, the latest viruses that have come out of bats that we're aware of are the Hennepin viruses, uh, Nipah virus in Southeast Asia. It infects pigs and pigs act as a multiplier to get it into humans. It's like the coronavirus, the, the, the uh, SARS. The SARS went into, into civet cats. These are little animals that are caught in the wild, they're not cats, they're, they're, and they're, they're, they were actually being used as a food source in China. They eat a lot of uh, live animal. they have live animal markets, they also eat all sorts of exotic foods, and they kill the animals freshly. And, um, and that's, that was the multiplier for SARS. Uh, it's Hennepin virus, the multiplier is a pig, though there are some cases where the virus has gone straight from bats to people. Hendra virus in, in Australia has only killed very few people, but it kills it's an absolutely horrible virus. It's a worse virus than Ebola. And the way it infects horses, and with the change in ecology in Australia, as we put more and more suburban developments and we've got horses staying in all sorts of places we didn't have them before, then uh, uh, some horses have got infected with this thing and, and it largely killed veterinarians because uh, uh, a horse, when it gets infected, uh, can put out an enormous amount of virus. I mean, it's a very big animal, obviously. So. These uh, viruses have been worked out at the uh, Geelong lab in Australia. And in fact, the, um, the, uh, uh, 
the Contagion movie has one of the chief characters, the virologist, using a bat cell line from, from Australia. So, so we actually raided somewhere. You know how it is in Ireland, it's a bit hard to get in the news, and it's the same in Australia. Influenza, though, is, is the real problem we know about. Now, and that doesn't mean it's going to be the next pandemic problem. It's just the, it's the one that always seems most likely. And the reason influenza is so problematic is that the virus changes all the time, as I'll, as I'll discuss, and there are Im immense numbers of ways it can change, and it changes unpredictably. And it's also incredibly infectious right from the time people catch it. So people can feel reasonably well, and they can travel, for example, and they can cough and splutter, and they can be pushing out a lot of virus. So classically, influenza infects the other family members and infects the people around you and all the rest of it. And that's our biggest fear as a pandemic virus. Of course, that doesn't mean that something's not going to come totally out of left field and really surprise us rather, rather nastily, uh, the type of uh, uh, scenario we do have in the Contagion movie, but it's the one we know about. Um, this is how influenza spread. This is one of the seasonal viruses. That's a standard virus strain which is mutated and it's now circulating again in, uh, in a human population in a slightly different form. The red is actually, it's not the Republican Party, it's actually uh, influenza, uh, another disease. And um, you can see that it starts in Texas and within six weeks it's right across the country. We hope this is not the colour of the next federal, next federal election in the United States. Um, flu, um, it's a negative sense RNA virus. It's quite simple. It has a genome of eight segments. And those eight segments uh, can repackage to give you variant viruses. If you get a cell infected with two different influenza viruses, you can get a repackaged virus, which will have some characteristics of one virus and some characteristics of another. The two surface glycoproteins, which are the ones that are susceptible to antibody attack because they are on the outside of the virus, and at their function, the hemagglutinin protein and the neuraminidase protein. The hemagglutinin protein's function is to get the virus into the cell. Viruses are obligate intracellular parasites. They can only grow within cells. They have to get in somehow. And so the hemagglutinin binds to sialic acid on the cell surface, a pretty ubiquitous receptor, and that's what gets the virus into the cell and it has other functions within the cell. The neuraminidase, the pink thing, is actually an enzyme, as you'd expect from the name, and it actually, its function is to get the virus away from the cell. So after the virus is replicated and you've got a whole lot of uh, new virus particles made, the neuraminidase gets the virus away again. You may have heard of the drugs like Tamiflu, uh, Relenza, which are actually neuraminidase blockers. And what they do is they don't stop the virus from being made, but they stop the virus from getting away from the cell because they block the neuraminidase action. So if you look down on an electron microscope at a virus-infected cell that's been treated with one of these uh, th things like Tamiflu, you'll actually see that the virus is, is, is tied onto the cell and it's not getting away. Now, the real problem with these viruses is they have a negative sense RNA genome and they are constantly mutating. They're constantly throwing off variants. There's no proofreading of the mechanism. Now, if, with a human population, we're, we're long-lived there are in, in the end analysis, there are limited numbers of, of us, if we're thinking in terms of a virus epidemic. And we also are vaccinated against these things. So you'll build up an immunity to a particular influenza virus. You, once you're immune to a particular influenza virus, you're very solidly immune. People that were infected in 1918 with the terrible pandemic virus that came at the end of the First World War were still immune. Those who were alive were still immune in 1976 when a variant virus, another virus came out that was very similar to that original virus. So immunity to influenza is lifelong to the particular virus. Because you've got all this immunity there, what you, do, what you have is an ideal situation for selecting variants because everyone's immune, the only way the virus can keep itself going is to select a variant that will then spread and come back and reinfect the people who were immune to the previous, uh, previous type of that virus, if you like. Now, 
These viruses are maintained in nature. They're maintained in pigs and they're maintained in, in birds, as I'll develop. Uh, but you don't have the same issue with birds and, 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 and chickens, for instance. Uh, pigs, for instance, as you know, uh, we're talking about farming at the beginning. I don't know whether you're going to cov carry, uh, cover island in pig farms. There's real problems in that, as they found in North Carolina. But um, it, it, um, it, with pigs, you've got a rapid turnover of pigs. I mean, pigs do not have a long, uh, gentle life. Uh, things, bad things happen if you're a pig. And, um, and basically, uh, uh, that means you've got a constant supply of fresh pigs. It's even worse if you're a chicken. Uh, don't wish yourself to be a chicken. And uh, so there's constantly a supply of new uh, stock that can be infected, unlike us. So these things normally don't change that much in birds and, and, uh, uh, and in pigs as they do in us. Spanish flu, 1918-19, was the worst acute pandemic of the modern era. Of course, um, AIDS, of course, we know is a terrible pandemic virus, but it's a, it's a persistent chronic situation, and it hasn't killed large numbers of people acutely. It's killing about three million people a uh, year. Actually, that's now dropping and, and the, as people change their behavior and they become more aware, and as we've been able to make more drug available to Africa uh, under various uh, programs like the American PEPFAR program and getting generic drug made in India out there and all that sort of thing, we, we've been dropping the incidence. The real concern with AIDS is that are we going to pay, be able to pay for that drug because all the, the advanced countries now, as uh, you're very familiar in Europe, are having financial problems. And so who's going to pay for this drug? And, and that's, that is a real concern with all sorts of, uh, of third world uh, 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 charity and, uh, and, and NGOs and all the rest of it. Now, 1918-19, it killed at least 40 million people, maybe 100 million. It went worldwide. It was very infectious, but it took a long while to spread because we didn't have airplanes. Um, airplanes spread influenza very quickly. The swine flu that we experienced in 2009, we now believe it was first detected in... Um, I think Mexico, California, I think at about March, April of 2009. We now believe that that virus was actually in Melbourne, Australia before it was diagnosed in Mexico and in California. Even though it clearly came from Mexico and California, it had already made that jump. Um, Airplanes spread the virus because they spread infected human beings. That doesn't mean if you're on a plane with someone with flu, you're at major risk. We do know that people who are, say, in an aisle seat are at somewhat greater risk, and we know that if you're sitting one or two rows from someone with influenza, you're at somewhat greater risk. But it doesn't spread through the air handling of the plane. What, what does spread it is infected human beings getting off planes and then spreading it uh, as they move through the community. Of course, there was no international air travel in 1918-19. The uh, virus actually didn't get to Australia till 1919, even though we had many troops coming back from Europe uh, and where the, the virus was raging in the, in the trenches and so forth. Um, uh, but the voyage, the sea voyage was so long that everyone had either got very sick and recovered or if some had died before it actually got there. And it didn't get there till 1919. It was rather less severe in Australia as a consequence. Um, it, uh, it helped bring the First World War to an end. It, it, it's called the Spanish flu. But in actual fact, if you read the excellent book on this by John Barry, uh, you'll, his, he develops the argument that in fact, the virus did come from China and that it came into American recruit camps and the Americans actually brought it across in their troop shops, ships and they certainly had a lot of deaths. And of course, once they came into Europe, you've got the Germans and the, and the, and the Allies fighting, so they're not going to admit that their troops are dying of influenza. And of course, the Spanish are not in the war and they put their hand up and say, hey, we've got the flu and it's called the Spanish flu. So, you know, it's that lesson that the lawyers tell you never admit to anything. And um, it's always been known as the Spanish flu. It's very interesting that there was a little children's rhyme at that time. I had a little bird, its name was Enza. I opened the window in influenza. And uh, actually, it's a bird virus. And of course, no one knew that at the time. There was no insight into that. Because the first human flu virus wasn't actually isolated until 1933. So here we are, you know, if you go back to the plague, for hundreds of years, we had no idea what was causing this infection. With influenza, it was uh, uh, 15 years before 
before we actually isolated the first human flu virus. The first pig one was isolated a couple of years earlier. And so it was a very long, long time, whereas with uh, SARS, we had the virus out in a couple of months. And I think a pandemic virus now, with some of the new diagnostics, PCR-based diagnostics, which have uh, uh, used relatively low stringency conditions, we would be able to actually work out what a virus was very, very quickly because uh, we, we know it belonged to a particular category, a particular family, possibly within 24, 48 hours. Uh, it took longer than that to work out SARS, but things have changed so much, as you know. Things have changed so much since 2002, and everything is moving at an incredible pace, and uh, the science is going in the right direction, maybe economics isn't, but still. <laughs> what can we say about economists? Um, Influenza viruses, they're maintained in nature as virus infections of aquatic birds. They're generally mild gastrointestinal tract infections of birds. That is, they're excreted in, into the water through the cloaca, through the common urogenital uh, and, uh, and um, alimentary opening. And uh, they don't usually cause all that much of a problem in birds, and if you go to any birds anywhere, uh, pretty much. You'll sample them and you'll find influenza viruses. There are loads of them. There are 16 different hemagglutinin types and nine different neuraminidase types. The top three, the H1, the H2 and the H3, are the ones that cross over into humans. And they've also crossed into pigs. H7, the ones where you see a human figure in black, these are situations where we occasionally get infections. They can be lethal, but they never become established in humans. There's an H7N7, that's a disease of horses that's established, and there's also now a, uh, I think it's an H3N8 that's established in dogs, uh, um, and that's only happened over the last few years. They can infect all sorts of species. Uh, we've had outbreaks in, in seal, for instance, uh, something like 400 seal dying in Boston Harbour, probably from eating infected seabirds. And so they'll cross over into whales and seals and leopards and all sorts of species, but often they don't become established. But they are well established in pigs and they can, they're well established in horses. We had a, a big outbreak in Australia uh, uh, some time back with racehorses that at, uh, weren't uh, properly quarantined, it seemed, and there were big reparations and so forth paid. Um, pandemics of the 20th century. Uh, the 1918 1919 virus, we're not quite sure about. We think it may have come from birds. It looks like a bird virus, but we're not quite sure went on, what went on then. Uh, obviously, it's very difficult to go back and isolate the viruses from that period, even with PCR techniques. I'll talk about that a bit later. Uh, the ones we do know about, the 1957 H2N2 Spanish flu, it's a reassortment. You've got this eight segmented genome, probably a reassorts in a pig. That there are two types of receptors, one in the birds, one in humans, and the pig has both types of receptors. The humans also have the bird type receptor very deep in their lung, it turns out, but, um, but the pig is the ideal mixing vessel for influenza, because if you say you get a human influenza and an avian influenza, the pig can be infected with both, and you can get this reassortment going on, and you'll get a new influenza virus coming out. That's why a lot of these viruses have come out of Asia, because you've got uh, warm conditions, you've got a lot of aquatic birds, a lot of water around, for instance, rice paddies and so forth, lakes, all the situations that allow for transmission, and uh, people living very close in traditional agricultural type communities. So that's the reason a lot of these things have come out of Asia. It's not because um, uh, they're doing anything wrong, it's just, it's just a societal organisation. The latest one, of course, didn't come out of Asia, it came out of pigs, and it's quite likely uh, that uh, that our next viruses will come out of pigs as well. The Hong Kong flu, it's a, a human virus, the H2N2 virus that came across in 1957, and the a duck virus, an H3N8, that combined gave the Hong Kong flu, which is H3N2. That virus, or variants of that virus, is still circulating today. In fact, they're currently the main flu problem in Australia, a mutated version of that is emerging as, uh, as causing uh, a pretty severe infection. I'm not, not sure what's happening in the Northern Hemisphere. Sometimes we give you flu viruses, sometimes you give us flu viruses. These things are global uh, with modern air travel. Um, so what defense do we have against infections like this? Well, we're large, complex, multicellular, multi-organ animals. Uh, we move, we live a long time, we reproduce very slowly and we have a very complex immune defense system. 
um, immunity. Uh, the word immune comes from immunus, which means without tax. The reason we've got an immune system is fundamentally to defeat the tax of infection. Uh, immunus describes a category of Roman soldier who, after returning from the wars, was exempt from tax. And so that's where the term comes from. And it, it deals constantly uh, with, uh, with simpler life forms. It, it fits in, in two sorts of categories. You've got innate immunity, which goes right across all the phylogeny. All phylogeny. It's in, in unicellular organisms are phagocytic. That's part of innate immunity. Um, if, uh, Jules Hoffman, if you heard him speak last night, he talked about innate immunity and of course the Nobel Prize this last year, half of it was for innate immunity to Jules and to Bruce Beutler. Uh, that was actually the first Nobel Prize for innate immunity since 1908 when it went to Metchnikoff for the phagocyte. Uh, there have been a number for the other type of immunity, the one that I study, adaptive immunity. Now adaptive immunity is specific to the vertebrates. It, it starts really, though you can find traces of it in lower vertebrates, it starts really with the jawed fishes. So it goes back something like 350 to 400 million years in evolution. And we can see the, the themes diverge. The, the adaptive immune systems of birds, probably more like dinosaurs, of mammals, of reptiles, are all, all have somewhat different types of characteristics, but their central themes are all the same. And they all do much the same sort of thing. Some better than others, but they have much the same characteristics. And the characteristic really is you have an enormous diversity of receptors, that it's slow to develop, and that you have what's called immunological memory. That is, the, the, we remember that we've encountered this thing or a bit of this thing, if it's a vaccine or a kill form of the thing, and, and we have a measure of protection that comes after that. Um, memory, uh, first recognized uh, by Thucydides, actually, in writing about the Peloponnesian Wars. He was writing about the plague of Athens, and he wrote that those who'd become the sick become sick and recovered were then protected. They could not catch the disease a second time and also that that was specific. That is, they were protected against that infection. Plague of Athens might have been typhus. We're actually not quite sure what it was. And, um, uh, and, and he re recognized that it was specific. Our immune systems remember that we've encountered that infection before. The memory picture there, of course, is Salvador Dali. It's not, he's not thinking about immunological memory. He's uh, thinking about, I think, neurological memory. And he's clearly uh, influenced by Einstein and the theory of relativity, which is why we have all these floppy clocks. Uh, it's when people you know, used to have uh, conversations against, um, about, uh, about relativity and things like that. Now they would talk about the latest Survivor program on TV or some dreadful nonsense. Um, so most vaccines, our successful vaccines work by the antibody response. This is one lineage of the immune response. It, it's, it works through um, cells that become big protein producing factories called plasma cells and they pump out these immunoglobulin molecules or antibody molecules. There's a tremendous diversity of types which bind to various structures on different, different viruses, bacteria and all the rest of it. And of course they can't predict what they're going to see because as I said at the beginning we're getting new infections coming in all the time. So we have to have a tremendous diversity of, of structures they can recognize and, and that they do really pretty well. Um, we first knew about antibody forming cells in 1948 with Astrid Fagrius who discovered the B cell and was in a PhD thesis. Uh, the immunoglobulins are secreted, they travel around in the blood, the plasma cells after they're generated can sit in our bone marrow for a very long time, they can pump out these antibodies and as I've said you can encounter these things, you can have yellow vac uh, smallpox vaccine for instance once and you're pretty much protected uh, for life. People did recommend boosting in the days before we got rid of smallpox, but it, it lasts a long time. The antibodies tend to, I mean, it's not invariable, they tend to, to bind to tertiary structure on proteins, the, the conformed structure of proteins, and the, the way they function in a virus infection is to grab hold of the surface proteins of the virus and stop it getting into the cell, or to also target other mechanisms like uh, complement and various things get, that can damage the virus when it recognises that it's got this molecule bound on it. And so there's sort of a molecular language there. Our very good vaccines are against viruses that 
cause what we call systemic infections, uh, like poliomyelitis, the virus has to get into the blood, it comes in through the gut, gets into the blood, goes to the brain. If we stop it going to the brain, it doesn't matter if it gets in the gut, because if it doesn't get to the brain, it doesn't damage our nerve cells and we don't get polio. Uh, measles, similarly, if we stop it, it doesn't go around, it comes in through the oropharynx. If it, uh, if it doesn't get into the blood, it doesn't cause the spots in the skin, it doesn't get into the brain, it doesn't get into the middle ear, it doesn't do all those horrible things that measles can do. Actually, a very bad infection, measles. And so where we're going into trouble is with viruses like HIV AIDS, which when they get in, like flu, they mutate and they change. And also HIV AIDS goes back into the genome, so it persists. And, uh, and so we have no, uh, we, we lose the battle with AIDS generally. Uh, with influenza, um, the virus variants that come along regularly escape, they don't escape within the individual, they, you get new escape mutants emerging in the population and then, uh, and then you, you get a problem and you have to make new influenza vaccines all the time. The vaccines themselves can be highly successful but uh, you have to keep making them. Uh, that's good for drug companies but it's not necessarily the best, uh, the best solution. We'd like to have more, more cross-reactive vaccines. Um, Vaccination, uh, real problems in developed countries. In Europe, in Australia, America, um, and so forth, there are with people who think they don't need to vaccinate their kids. I mean, they've never seen many of these infections, and uh, they think it's an imposition to vaccinate children against infections that they may never see. Uh, we recently had, uh, we've had instances of people going from Europe unvaccinated children carrying measles to developing countries where people had it under control and causing outbreaks. We recently had an outbreak in a, uh, an alternative school in Australia where the kids weren't vaccinated and someone brought it back from Southeast Asia. It's a nasty infection and it causes a lot of damage and it's not something that should be taken lightly at all. There's another component of the immune system, and that's the component of the immune system that I've been involved in, and I'm not going to talk at length about it, but that's the CD8, or, or I'll say a bit about it, that's the killer T cell response. Whereas the antibody molecule is secreted by the plasma cell, it goes around the body and the blood, grabs hold of virus when it comes in, and this stuff's circulating all the time. Uh, if you test our blood, and we've been vaccinated against various things, you'll find antibodies in the blood, a standard uh, serological test. Uh, the killer T cell, on the other hand, is a cell that has the job of killing other cells. Now, before about 1960, we had no idea that there were actually cells in our body that have the job of killing other cells, very specifically killing other cells. Uh, we knew that there were cells that killed other cells in the sense that they ate them. You know, we all kill everything because we all eat things and, and everything we, I mean, our feeding habit all depends on killing. The only thing you don't kill is a fruit tree, I suppose, but we're always killing things. Everything's being killed and uh, we, we survive by death, so to speak. And um, happy thought. Uh, um, but basically the, the killer T cells is an up close and personal cell. It's there to destroy other cells and in virus infections, because the viruses have to grow in cells, the cell is a factory that produces new virus particles. So if you're going to terminate an infection, you've got to kill that cell factory, and that's what the, the killer T cell does. Now, the Roman legionnaire had two, two basic types of weapons. He had a spear called the pilium, which he threw. So that's more like an antibody molecule. It was a very smart spear. It had a very soft iron tip, so that when it hit, it bent over, which meant you couldn't throw it back and if you tried to pull it out of a shield, say, it tended to break off and make the shield very unwieldy. But, but his main weapon was he had a shield that protected him, and he had this short stabbing sword, and, uh, and also a dagger. And that's really the way the, uh, the killer T cell actually works. Uh, these are cells that go into tissues, they're circulating in blood, they go into tissues, and they destroy infected cells, or in some cases, tumour cells. And we're trying to manipulate that type of the response, particularly in cancer therapy, cancer immunotherapy. Uh, it's, it's mixed success. It works with some of the virus-induced cancers quite well, like Epstein-Barr virus. Um, people are trying to get it going for human papillomavirus, the thing that causes cervical cancer, not working quite so well, and it's very variable against other tumours. Though other tumours do seem to be under the control of this type of cell, uh, particularly melanoma. The killer T cell um, works by uh, creating a channel in the membrane. It, by, there's a 
poor forming. When you get specific recognition, there's a poor forming protein called perforin that makes a channel, so stuff comes in, including a lot of serine esterases that actually trigger the cell death pathway in the target cell. So it's called a killer cell. It's actually an inducer of suicide cell. That's a whole very big area of science, and I won't attempt to go into it, but it's uh, an absolutely fascinating area of research. Here you can see some killer T cells at work. Um, this is a serial killer, and my other killer's not running, unfortunately. Um, this one on the, here, there he goes. Watch this one. This is one killer T cell. He's gonna kill that big cell. You'll see the cell called turn pink as his membranes is, is compromised, okay? And then, now that cell's not dead. It, it, it's doing a passive limitation. It's blebbing stuff from its surface. It's not a very healthy cell. And, and you can see multiple cells being killed there. So these things are pretty dramatic, and they're, uh, they're, they're real hitmen. You can watch that for hours. These, these movies were made by Misty Jenkins, who's, uh, who was a graduate student with us. She's since been with Gillian Griffith and Joe Trapani, and, uh, and these are very recent movies of his, hers. Um, now, the killer T cells recognize uh, the cell. They're not targeted to the virus. They're recognizing the cell that's infected with the virus. And what they're recognizing, and I won't go into this in detail because it's just too complicated, and that was the subject of my talk the other day. What they recognize is the transplant molecules, the molecules that are recognized in graft rejection. The reason they're there is actually they're not marking foreignness off, they're actually marking self off, and when the virus infects the cell, a little bit of the virus comes to the surface of the cell in these transplant molecules, and then that cell looks as though it comes from a foreign individual, and these killer T cells bump it off. Um, and so this, uh, the year we got the Nobel Prize, this, um, this picture on the right, which has an X-ray crystallographic picture of a T cell receptor peptide MHC transplantation, that is, major histocompatibility protein complex. And it's that peptide that, that, that is foreign that actually leads the T cell to destroy the infected cell. Uh, this is a, a, a recent picture from our own lab where we're doing all sorts of manipulations to try and understand this recognition event much, much better. When we first discovered this back in 1973-74, we couldn't do any of the molecular strategies that would actually show us what was really happening at this interface. In fact, we were drawing sort of diagrams of ping pong balls killing other ping pong balls with squiggly lines on their surface. Now we're going to get down to van der Waals forces and where the hydrogen goes and, and mutating through the peptide and mutating through the receptor and seeing how that influences the immune response and doing really wonderful science. And of course, that's the fascination of biology over the last 20 years is this tremendous molecular revolution, which has so enabled us to really bring uh, complex sciences like immunology into uh, very precise sciences and into chemistry. I mean, I don't know if we got to physics yet, but we're, we're sort of at least getting to chemistry. And um, now, there are a lot of different peptides recognized from a virus-infected cell. They, this is from a mouse experiment. They tend to come from internal proteins of the virus. And the internal proteins of the virus, the ones that are only in the, inside the virus or inside the virus-infected cell, tend to be much less variable because they're not under that antibody-mediated selection, though there is some selection through this mechanism. And uh, that often gives us much more cross-reactive responses. So because these responses are much more cross-reactive between different viruses, there's been great interest in trying to develop them for, um, for actually uh, vaccination pr pr processes, particularly vaccines against HIV AIDS, vaccines against influenza. With HIV AIDS, it generally hasn't been a great success because there's a lag phase in these responses getting going, and by the time the virus, uh, the response gets going, the virus is in and it tends to get away. Uh, with influenza though, because influenza viruses are normally eliminated, if we turn on these types of responses, we can often get rid of the virus much more quickly, and, um, and that Means, uh, may mean the difference between getting very sick and just getting a little bit sick. And in fact, the best influenza vaccine might really be one that allowed us to get a little bit infected, uh, not too infected. I mean, it's, you can get a little bit infected. It's not like being a little bit pregnant. You can get a little bit infected. And, and that would give you a boosting response and that boosting response would be kind of ideal. A sterilizing response, for instance, will stop this type of response from happening. All immune responses depend on, on first selecting from a very small number of precursor cells that have got the right receptor, and then cell division, which we call clonal expansion. 
And then some of those cells that divide and divide and divide, as they divide and divide and divide, they differentiate. They differentiate from being a rather resting, rather innocuous looking cell to being large, angry cells with all this stuff for killing in their cytoplasm. Uh, they become the effector cells, they do the job of bumping other cells off, and then some of them also go on to become memory cells, and they hang around forever and can be recalled much more quickly to actually give us an immune response. Um, this is uh, just mapping some of those responses at the clonal level by actually characterising the T-cell receptors uh, using, uh, using uh, single-cell PCR, uh, use, f subsequent to sorting for the particular T-cell specificity. It's uh, kind of complex, I won't go into it, but you see these clonal expansions, you see them settle down into memory, then when you come back with a secondary challenge, you see the massive expansion again, massive secondary responses. Um, here we see one in the lung of a mouse. If you look at the top right-hand corner of those plots, they're flow cytometry pot plots, the blue ones in the top right-hand corner are the actual immune T-cells coming into the lung of a virus-infected mouse and getting rid of the virus in the lung of the mouse. So you can see in a primary response where they've never seen these uh, viruses before, it takes about seven to 10 days to develop. And between day seven and 10, you'll get the virus wiped out of the lung. And that can happen in the, in the absence of most other elements of the specific immune response. You can get that happening. Um, the T cells can do the job. The ones below are mice that were actually primed up uh, and th this is a secondary response. And you can see there's a much bigger response, um, a much bigger response uh, on, in, in that top right. But you can actually see that it still doesn't get going until about day five. And so even though it's a much bigger response, it takes time to get going again. The reason it takes time to get going again is it pretty much needs to get going uh, out, uh, outside the lung. The sum goes on directly in the lung, but mostly it has to get going in what we call the lymphoid tissue. Um, and it's a much bigger response, but if you look at the black dots, that's the virus being eliminated in the primary response. The white dots are the virus being eliminated in the secondary response. And you can see it's a little bit quicker. But that difference in time, because the virus is growing like this, if you stop that virus growth there and virus damage there, it may be too late and you may die. If you stop it down here, the whole thing is not as severe and you can survive. And so it's all uh, just numbers, really, uh, when you get down to it. Um, human uh, T cells, same thing, they recognise these peptides. Uh, actually, the, um, it, it, what's interesting about this is there's a nuclear protein from the 2009 uh, uh, H1N1 swine flu virus. It, that nuclear protein is almost identical to the one from the Spanish 1918. The Spanish 1918 virus burnt out in us, but it went into pigs and then it modified a bit in pigs and it just sat there until we got the 2009 virus. And that particular protein is almost identical to the 1918 protein. And uh, that was kind of an interesting surprise. Humans, uh, there is some evidence that priming up these CD8 responses can give you a measure of protection. And a lot of people are now interested in it from the point of view of making more cross-reactive vaccines. So there's a whole lot of stuff going on, a lot of observation out there in the, in the marketplace. Now, other things that happen, uh, the reason that some of these viruses are so severe is that, like the 1918 one, is that the early innate response just goes crazy. And we get all sorts of toxic molecules being produced trying to get rid of the virus before that adaptive immune response comes in and actually does the job. So that, that limits the infection, tremendously important in bacterial infections, we'd really get overwhelmed very quickly if we didn't have innate immunity or fungal infections, as you would have seen yesterday with Jules Hoffman. But um, it can, if it's too effulgent, it can cause vascular leakage, it can cause shock, and, and people actually die from the immune response. There's a lot of interest in how we should best intervene in that process where we can see that happening. But we don't really understand well enough yet what's going on there to know what we should try and stop which elements of this we should try and stop, because there are many components in it. So there's a great deal of research going on, and we're gradually pulling that apart as we use a very sophisticated technology, uh, particularly on things like knockout mice, where we can take various bits out of the immune response and actually see what it is that we need and we don't need. We're finding all sorts of unexpected things. Some of the things we, cells we thought were very deleterious, like neutrophils, we're actually finding they're very important for repair. So th th there's a whole understanding developed 
uh, developing now uh, over the last five to ten years, really, there's a whole new understanding of what we call pathology, the actual disease process itself that we simply did not have before. We, we haven't known, actually, in many situations, why it is that a particular infection actually kills. Uh, and we're starting to understand why and how and, and, and what really goes on. Um, that 1918 virus had to be reconstructed. It was reconstructed by PCR, by Jeffrey Taubenberger and Johan Hulton, who went into either tissue specimens that had been stored in the Armed Forces Institute of Pathology in Washington, D.C. These are formal and block tissues that have been there since 1918. Uh, or they went into people that have been buried in the permafrost in Alaska, and they got genetic material out of that. And of course, you, as you're all aware, uh, this sort of archaeological a DNA type approach has allowed us to say that the plague was actually caused by the plague bacterium. Until recently that was quite controversial, but they've gone back into those burial sites from the 14th, 15th century and actually found the bug. Giving that reconstructed virus, which was made by PCR and stitching it together to primates, uh, causes a horrible disease, which is a bit like what the virulent H5N1 bird flu does in humans. Uh, the pandemic H1N1 virus came from, the one that circulated recently, came from two pig viruses. It came from a American pig viruses and Asian pig viruses. And they somehow got together and made this new vi variant of a virus that spread very well in us and spread very quickly. Um, how an Asian flu got together with an American flu, I don't know. Maybe the Asian pig went on a package holiday to Mexico or something, but we don't know how it happened. And, and actually, there's a lot of illegal movement of animals around the world, which is really very dangerous. We've actually, we're now having a big problem in Australia with a paramyxovirus in pigeons. Someone's brought this pigeon virus in uh, illegally, in illegally imported pigeons, and it's uh, killing pigeons, and we don't know what other wildlife it's going to kill. So actually, if you know of anyone uh, who smuggles birds or anything, tell the police, have them arrested and shot. Um, so. 2009 H1N swine flu, uh, it caused severe disease. It was thought to be relatively mild. It spared old people because anyone born before 1950 had neutralizing antibody against it. So it seemed less severe than flu usually is, but actually it put a lot of healthy young people in hospital and it was terrible in indigenous populations. A number of people were saved by using heart-lung machines, by using ECMO. And uh, of course, that facility in a really bad flu outbreak will quickly be saturated, so there would be little availability. And, and really, the sociology of it was very interesting. The, uh, the emergency rooms got jammed up with the worried well. And that's a real issue, because if the worried well are coming into emergency rooms where they really are sick people, then that's a very good way of spreading the infection. So public education is enormously important in pandemic situations, it's, and it's important to have pandemic plans. A lot of pandemic plans were put together for the H5N1 bird flu when we thought that might jump across, but it's important to keep them updated and keep people aware of them. And of course, being human beings, once the risk is gone, we forget all about it and we don't do anything, and then we're, we're surprised when something happens. But uh, that's what we are. Um, risk factors, uh, obesity, diabetes, pregnancy. Uh, pregnancy was a real risk factor with the H5, H1N1 virus. And a lot of pregnant women, uh, this is unusual, were in, uh, in intensive care and some died. Uh, there seemed to be an association with one of the MHC proteins that's common in, uh, in indigenous populations. Malnutrition was a real risk factor. It was thought that only really few people had died, but now the, the CDC, the Communicable Diseases Centre at Atlanta, which is one of the great monitoring organisations, you also have organisations like this in Europe, ca calculates in, in excess of 500 million people died. So that's a fair number. It's the, kind of the number that the kids that die every year from malaria, but it's still a lot of people, and it's not a highly desirable situation. Um, stopping flu, we have the antivirals. I mentioned those before. You have to give them very early. There's a lot of debate about just how useful they are. If you give them early enough, they can certainly stop, stop the infection, but most people don't come in quickly enough to get them at an early enough stage. And so uh, if there's a flu pandemic on, it, it's not a bad idea if you have some of this stuff. Uh, it doesn't do any damage, and you can take it uh, early on, but of course the doctors don't like that idea, and of course you don't want to make a mistake and be suffering from malaria and trying to treat flu. A um, lot of strategies to try and make cross-reactive antibody responses. Same thing is going on with HIV. They're trying to make the immune system 
Uh, they're trying to distract it. They're trying to distract it from what it usually sees, the more variable parts of the virus, and make it see more common parts of the virus. And they're doing various things like chopping the variable head off the protein and, and, and that sort of strategy. And whether we can actually make a vaccine like that is, is, is a question. But really, with things like influenza, uh, we've got to develop strategies that actually make the immune response work better than it actually does. So what we're trying to do in immunology now is do better than nature. And nature actually does pretty well, but if we're going to solve these these, these sorts of issues, we have to do research to actually make things work better. And uh, the, the question is, can we actually do that? Some are very sceptical. Uh, there's also another target for the cross-reactive flu vaccines. There's a transmembrane protein called MD M2E, a channel protein, which is highly uh, conserved. And so people are trying to target that. And we're getting better at getting immune responses to that. So we might end up with a flu vaccine in the future. Uh, that's sort of a belt and braces vaccine. It sort of turns on the T-cell response, has some of these cross-reactive antibodies, maybe doesn't give you total protection but gives you reasonable protection. The real problem with getting that going would be the cost of developing it and whether or not the drug companies really want to take it on because it requires big pharma to really uh, take these things on and test them and, and at the moment they're, they're doing reasonably well out of flu vaccines. And so the H5N1 bird flu, um, since infecting uh, humans in 1997, it's known to have killed at least a quarter of a million, probably half a million, maybe even a billion, uh, half a billion, maybe even a billion chickens. Now, that's been an enormous economic cost for the developing world because you know how marginal life can be in those countries and taking all that protein out can be a very big, a very big factor. Uh, we know this virus changed in, at Qinghai Lake uh, in Western China in about 2005 and that it then started to kill wild birds, which is pretty unusual. When you think about it, flu is the ideal, uh, has the ideal mechanism for maintaining in nature. So even when this virus changes and it kills wild birds, it was killing geese, uh, flamingos, swans, but it wasn't killing ducks because these are species are all very different. So they'll have different susceptibility patterns, just as chimps are less susceptible to disease, severe disease from HIV than humans. It's basically a chimp virus that crosses into humans. So if you've got that sort of situation, the virus is excreted in water through the gastrointestinal tract, survives very well in water, and then it can infect all the different species of birds, some of which may be severely infected, but others are less severely infected, and then can carry the virus, and it was carried west into Europe and to North Africa. I know some people doubt that it was actually carried by birds, but the guys who work with the bird flu and bird viruses reckon it definitely was. So so I, it, um, it, it's, uh, I think, pretty definitely so. Uh, you will be aware of the recent controversial experiments where they took that virus and adapted it to ferrets, which is said to be a, uh, a marker for, for passage in humans. It didn't actually kill ferrets, but it did transmit between ferrets. I, I think those experiments were okay because they were done under very high security conditions by very good people, and everyone was vaccinated. You wouldn't want to do that sort of experiment with Ebola, which is not something you want to see change. But what they're trying to do is stay a jump ahead of the virus and work out what the mutations might be. One of the mutations they've found is actually found in every lethal case of H5N1 bird flu in Egypt. So it has been useful in that sense. Um, at the moment, the vaccines that's been, that has been made is probably still protected because the virus hasn't been changing that much in the antigenic sense. So there we are with flu. Um, Flu viruses, I think it's highly likely the next flu pandemic could again come out of US pigs. Uh, those viruses are changing very fast. They didn't used to change much, but there's a new gene that's come in from birds, we think, a polymerase, that's actually causing them to reassort very quickly. So the Americans are putting a lot of effort into flu surveillance in pigs now. And we've had one virus come out, an H3N2 came out of the pigs, didn't spread too much, and, uh, and, but we're waiting to see what else might come out of them. Uh, in Australia, we're currently seeing the H3N2 Hong Kong flu uh, at higher levels since then in 2007. And basically, especially if you're older, you should always take the flu vaccine. I take it whenever I can get it. I work both in the Northern Hemisphere and the Southern Hemisphere, so I get twice as much flu vaccine as everybody else, and uh, I'm, I'm quite happy about it. So there we are. That's what I can tell you about flu. He's telling us we have to leave. But will we not have one question? No? Yes, here's one down over here. Hi, I loved your talk. It's Emma Teeling from UCD, and I'm a bat biologist. Yes. Oh, so I'm just going to, to ask you a question. 
I know that bats are supposed to be the reservoirs for many of our very nasty viruses, yes. Ebola, rabies, Marburg, so forth, you show that. But to me, I see it as a great opportunity because they have large populations that have high penetrance of these viruses, but they don't seem to get sick. Yeah, it's so fascinating. Yeah. Do you think that they are, the bat genome is a good place to start to look for yeah, how nature can deal with these viruses that Absol would typically absolutely. make Absolutely. There's, there's a, um, a lot of this virus work is going on in Melbourne, uh, in Geelong, at the Australian Animal Health Lab, and they're developing a whole bat immunology thing because the, the fact is these viruses sit in the bats, they don't worry the bats much, and they persist in them, and there's enormous numbers of them, so we're suddenly realizing bats are an incredible reservoir of infection. That doesn't mean we should go out and kill all the bats. That would be insane because they're very important in various aspects of ecology. And so, uh, uh, yeah, I think um, they're, they're about, I, I found out when I was talking in Australia, I, I thought relatively few people were interested in that. I found out there are 300 licensed bat handlers. You have to be a licensed bat handler. And actually, though we, and, and we've had a couple of deaths actually uh, in Australia from a bat lissa virus, which is so close to rabies virus, though we don't have rabies in Australia, that we actually now va vaccinated all our bat handles with, with bat lissa virus. So I hope you're vaccinated. <laughs> so, this is a wonderful point to end because Emma Teeling is um, one of Ireland's most brilliant young scientists and she's a bat expert and it emphasises the importance of funding basic research because that... Well, you heard how important, important flies are yesterday and now you hear how important bats are. <laughs>